Doc Talk is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Hey there, folks. I'm Dr. Dan. Welcome to Doc Talk. We're excited that you joined us today. We're going to have a great show. Dr. Mike Apley from the College of Veterinary Medicine, who is a clinical pharmacologist, is going to join us and talk to us about the changes that are occurring in antibiotics, whether it's in the feed or in the water. It's bound to be a great show. Stay tuned. Thanks. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do, every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. This segment brought to you by the new Hired Hand Portable Cow Sprayer. For more information, visit cowsprayer.com. Hey, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Folks, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Mike Apley, who is a boarded clinical pharmacologist and a professor here at the veterinary school at Kansas State University. And there's a lot of changes going on. Mm hmm and uh, specifically, you know, the changes with the veterinary feed directive, changes in antibiotics in the feed, and it's kind of hard to keep up on all of it, but that's something that you do for us in the industry and, and beyond. And so tell us what got this dang thing started. Oh, man, it's a, we only got a half hour, don't we? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, well, it all started back in the 60s with concerns about the use of antibiotics in feed for livestock. And there have been numerous reports and studies up through that time, waxing and waning of interest, and things continue to build to reaching ahead now. And in a few years ago, Guidance 209 came out. So the way the FDA talks to us is through guidance documents. And this is a guidance for industry, us being the industry and in the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And they said two things in that document. They said, we don't think that the use of antibiotics for growth promotion is a judicious use. And they use the term judicious because they get to define that rather than using the term hazard, which has got a whole regulatory cascade that happens when you start that. Second thing they said is, all antibiotics that are used in the feed and water for livestock are going to be veterinary controlled under veterinary oversight. Whereas now, as our listeners would know, they can go buy a bag of medicated feed milk replacer, medicated feed, or uh, medications to put in the feed, or water medication without a prescription. Just go to the farm store. Farm wherever store, wherever you need want to go. That's being viewed as not being well enough controlled with the concerns about antibiotic resistance today. So in 2012, the final version of 209 came out after much discussion. Then they needed to give us a roadmap on how to accomplish Guidance 209, and that's Guidance 213. Okay. That's directions for the companies to open up the labels that are affected, remove any growth promotion claims, which are claims strictly for increase in feed efficiency or rate of gain without any disease prevention or control or treatment. And there are 26 companies that are affected and 283 products. Wow. And so a lot of those products are generic copies of one another or something like that or combinations, but still a large number of, of labels that are going to need to be developed. The clock started ticking this year, and these companies are expected to have complied by December of 2016. So that's when all these changes will come about. Required veterinary oversight, meaning you can't just purchase them over the counter, and also that... Uh, uh, no growth promotion claims for those antibiotics through the feed and water. So anything that has the growth promotion claim or that, that's coming off? Well, there's a couple very important exceptions for cattlemen, and the number one would be uh, the ionophores. So monensin, which we know is rumensin, one example, and then the bambermycins, which we know is GamePro, 
those would be ex exempt from this because we just don't have any indication they're related to anything used in human medicine. And then um, bacitracin, which we don't use much, but for our swine producer listeners, tiamulin is one that's a pleural mutilin is, is not included. So those are the four main groups that wouldn't be included that are exempt from this. But uh, tetracyclines included, um, any growth promotion claims, stuff like that. Cool. We're going to take a break, folks. When we come back, we're going to continue with Dr. Apple and we're going to talk about what kinds of antibiotics this, this ruling will affect. Thanks for watching, Doc. This Meet the Future Veterinarian is brought to you by Zuprivo. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprivo for BRD treatment. Emily Sievert was raised in a small farming community in Western Ohio and is a fourth year student at the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. She studied bovine respiratory disease in beef feedlots and was also involved in a related telemedicine project. Upon graduation, Emily plans to focus on food animal medicine, pathology, and food safety. Some call it a come from behind victory, an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment, our victory dance, because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprivo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprivo. Zuprivo is a fast acting, long lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprivo for Merck Animal Health. Hey folks, Dr. Dan here. Be sure to join me in Wichita, Kansas, September 15th and 16th, as myself, Dr. Tom Knopfsinger, and Dr. Mike Appley are gonna host Beef Today's Cowboy College. We're gonna talk about how to start cattle on feed and some of the new management techniques of getting calves started on feed. To register, go on the internet to www.beeftoday.com backslash cowboy college, get registered, and I'll see you in Wichita, Kansas, September 15th and 16th. No matter where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? Healthy cows start with the new Hired Hand Automatic Livestock Sprayer. Rancher invented to provide an efficient alternative to pour-on and injectable parasite management systems. The portable design allows cattle to treat themselves head to hoof. Strategic device placement with pass-through activation technology takes the stress out of parasite treatment for cattle and the rancher. Get the new Hired Hand for yourself or become a distributor. Visit cowsprayer.com. The new Hired Hand makes healthy cows easy. This segment is brought to you by Norbrook Laboratories, manufacturers of Enriflox 100, the newest addition to your arsenal for treating bovine and swine respiratory disease. Hey there, folks. Welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Mike Apley, and we're with the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University, where Dr. Apley is a boarded clinical pharmacologist and is a national and international leader on many of the topics having to do with antibiotics and food animal. And... When, when we left, we were talking about the guidance documents and kind of what got us here. Now let's start to break it down and, and talk about which antibiotics this is going to affect. So it's, as we talked before the break, basically everything except the ionophores. Yep. And the bambromycins, which again we know is like Game Pro, bacitracin, and the pleuromutilins, which is tiamulin when it's used in swine and not in cattle. So those are four that are exempt. And then the next question is, well, if it's everything else, which specific uses? So the uses that are disappearing is any labeled inclusion, so say in milk replacer or in feed, that has a growth promotion claim. So only for increased feed efficiency or improved rate of gain. Those are gone. Those are gone. Unless they're able to show that, say, for example, 10 milligrams per head per day, which is the growth promotion claim, has a claim for uh, or an effect in preventing a disease or controlling gotcha. a disease. But they're going to have to bring the data to the CVM to show that, and it would probably require some more extensive additional work with that. 
the thing about Guidance 213 is it holds a carrot out there that says if you just want to come in, pull the growth promotion claims and add the part about we are going to require veterinary oversight, then we'll just let you do that without opening up the rest of what we call the package where they might be required, well, you need to update this, that, that, which can run into millions of dollars. So uh, examples that uh, our listeners might use where they will now need a veterinary authorization to do that would be, for example, using oxytetracycline or chlortetracycline in the feed of newly arrived calves at one gram per 100 pounds per day. That's a therapeutic claim, not prevention, not control, not growth promotion. You can still use it, but you'll have to have a veterinarian provide what's called the veterinary feed directive. Gotcha. And the VFD will require veterinary supervision or oversight and the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine is leaving the definition of that veterinary oversight up to the states. So each state will be deciding exactly how they will define that. And it could go as deep as how often a veterinarian would need to examine the animals or talk to the owner. It could be more superficial than that. So that's the big change. Well, the, and I think the big thing is is that one of the big changes that's going to have to happen is the, the veterinarians have to be on the farm. I mean, I mean, yes, the veterinarian's on the farm today, but it's it's going to put the veterinarian in a position to really serve rural America by being on the farm proactively rather than reactively. And everyone needs to understand that this is a way to put the veterinarian in a position of being responsible for maintaining the tools we have today. Judicious use. Do we really need to use these and are we using them in the best manner? That's going to be up to your veterinarian to help a producer define and understand and the, uh, the eyes are upon us. Yep. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the oversight, just like what we're talking about here, and things that will be required for producers to, to utilize these products with the new guidance documents. You're watching Doc Talk, and we'll be back in a minute. The BQA Tip of the Day, sponsored by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica Inc. Hello, folks. This is Dr. Nels Lindbergh with Animal Medical Center and Production Animal Consultation out of Great Bend, Kansas. Today's BQA Tip of the Day, we want to visit about castration of cattle. There are many tools that we need to castrate animals. Scalpel blade, Newberry, Calicrate. We want to focus on being very clean and sanitizing our, our instruments as we are castrating. But more importantly, we want to visit about the age in which we are castrating these animals. We get so many animals that we're castrating 500 pounds, 900 pounds, very big animals. We want to be able to castrate these animals when they're babies or newborn to where we're only using a scalpel blade and we have minimal effect on these animals, their life, pain, performance. They go on, do the proper things, and we don't have to castrate these animals when they're 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds. It's best for the animal. We want to do what's best for that calf. Thank you. Say this is a calf that's been run through the chute a few too many times. Going through the chute stresses cattle, causing them not to eat like they should. Luckily, Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ provides proven protection against key respiratory diseases in a single shot with just one trip through the chute. Talk to your veterinarian about Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ, and soon your calves will relax and eat like a whole different animal. Broadband has become as important to us as highways. That is why Doc Talk is teaming up with NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association, and rural broadband companies like Blue Valley Telecommunications in fighting for quality broadband access through the program Smart Rural Communities. I don't think we have any idea what's coming in the future. I couldn't have imagined five years ago what we're doing today. So in two years, I would guess there's things we can't imagine that we're going to be doing. To learn more, visit ntca.org forward slash smart or bluevalley.net. Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We're having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. unbelievable. 
TrueTest Group, weighing systems, electronic identification, EID, electric fencing, and dairy automation systems help farmers and ranchers around the world manage the performance of their livestock for ultimate profitability. Folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Mike Appley, who is a board of clinical pharmacologist and a national and international leader on pharmacology, uh, specifically when we start to talk about antibiotics and food animals. Uh, there isn't anybody that is more of a go-to type person for information in the world than Dr. Appley, and, and it's an honor and a pleasure to have him here on the show. Mike, when we talk about this new, the new regulations coming, there's going to be some oversight. Now, how are we going to get this done and still be able to, you know, do our business? Yeah. We're working on that. Okay. And that's why each state is going to be responsible for defining their oversight. And I, I think the state uh, boards of veterinary medicine, boards of veterinary examiners, they're called different things to different states, uh, the agriculture entities and in the individual states, uh, state associations of veterinary medicine, state cattlemen, swine producers, whatever types of groups you have are pretty well aware of this now. And they're working together to say, how do we, how do we make this happen? And uh, there's concerns, for example, what if I need to have drug X for the feed? I'm having an outbreak. I want to add it in the next mix. And I don't know where my veterinarian is or I've got to get a hold of them. We've got to start laying those plans now on how to do this. And you need to have a working relationship with your veterinarian. They need to know your operation and you need to know them and uh, they can write and authorize these. Uh, the duration of the veterinary feed directive, which is required, will be required for all feed antibiotics, is still up in the air. It's going to be dependent on the label for each drug. So, for example, there's two versions of a drug called tilmycosin mm -hmm. right now, one for swine, one for cattle. One, the authorization is good for 45 days, and the other it's good for 90. So we're hoping that we have some consistency in the duration. So that's how often they have to get the veterinary feed directive? To, is to authorize. Every 45 days or every 90 days? Yeah. And we really don't have that on our parental drugs. No. You we, know, as far as the definition, you know, when I would write scripts as a, as a consulting veterinarian, I did it every quarter. Right. But uh, so we, we might have as long as up to six months now is what they're saying, but it will depend on individual drug label. And that's all up in the air, and we'll, we'll know more as we move but, forward. But the, the thing is, is there, there's going to have to be that VCPR, define, you know, clinical cases, and, and, and have those documents in order. It's no different than animal welfare or anything of that nature. It's really going to be in the best interest of the producer to have these kind of definitions laid out when they're asked. It's a planning process, and it's nothing different than what you have to have in place now to purchase a prescription injectable drug. So we're just adding those in. So, so uh, anything else on the oversight that, that people need to be aware of? Uh, when will this, you know, kick in, in? December of 16, and it, it depends on the individual labels. If there's an individual label that's approved before that, it might go into effect sooner. So our listeners need to sit down with their veterinarian and discuss every drug they're currently using or may use in the feed and water, every antibiotic, so that they can start laying plans for this on how that'll be taken care of. Well, it's great. When we come back, we're gonna discuss with Dr. Apley what's next and, and talk about the, the veterinary feed directives and, and other drugs that may be affected. You're watching Doc Talk. We're glad that you joined us. This hog is Hanover hoof for meal made from U.S. soybeans. Now, one hog isn't that impressive, but suppose we add another, and another, and another. Before long, you've got billions of hungry customers around the world all clamoring for the same thing. Our soybeans. Learn more about the billion-dollar appetite of animal agriculture at beyondtheelevator.com. Brought to you by America's Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. It must be a, a, an inherited trait because I have never wanted to do anything other than be in the cattle business. And it's interesting as I have grandchildren now, little bitty ones, 
all they want to do is go to the barn, swing a rope, and be a cowboy. It's it's something. It's a it's a lifestyle that we have, the way we make a living, obviously. But it's really more than that. It gives us the opportunity as a family to be able to work together and enjoy each other's company and make a living at the same time. We've been using Triangle for years, and the reason we do it has been safe and effective, and we're going to continue to do that. We'll put the cows in the chute twice a year, spring and fall. 100% of our cattle get vaccinated with Triangle. Working your cattle just got easier. Introducing the new Vet Gun Delivery System, a new way to apply topical insecticides to your cattle. The Vet Gun lets you remotely treat cattle with effective parasite control, so you can do it just walking among the herd. It's that simple. The proven topical insecticide AML Vet Cap is used with the Vet Gun. It works fast to control horn flies and lice while minimizing stress on your cattle. Fast, easy, effective. Vet Gun. Check with your animal health supplier for availability. Hey folks, Dr. Dan here. Be sure to join me in Wichita, Kansas, September 15th and 16th, as myself, Dr. Tom Knopfsinger, and Dr. Mike Appley are going to host Beef Today's Cowboy College. We're going to talk about how to start cattle on feed and some of the new management techniques of getting calves started on feed. To register, go on the internet to www.beeftoday.com backslash cowboy college. Get registered, and I'll see you in Wichita, Kansas, September 15th and 16th. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. Improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Mike Apley. We're from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University where Dr. Apley is a clinical pharmacologist and a national and international expert on food animals and antibiotic usage. And, and we've talked about everything that's happening, but you know, what's, what's, what are we going to be facing next? What are we going to be looking at next with antibiotics? Well, when you split uses of antibiotics and food animals mm -hmm. into different categories, you have therapy, prevention, control, and growth promotion. So growth promotion's leaving for antibiotics. And our current administration, the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, considers the use of antibiotics for prevention and control of disease in food animals to be a judicious use, okay. an appropriate use, and they lump it in with therapeutics. There's multiple advocacy groups which would not lump that in. So prevention and control is the next thing to look at. Uh, I think everyone's well aware that, that those are going to be the next uses. And those would be stuff like metaphylaxis for or mass treatment on arrival for new cattle. Yeah. And would that be just in the feed or would this be feed and parental? I don't know. Don't it know seems yet? like feed and water because it medicates the whole herd or flock at the same time seems to be uh, having a higher focus on it. Uh, injectables, if applied to the whole group, surely aren't out of the question to be discussed. So for beef cattle, it'd be anything administered uh, to the group on arrival at the feedlot, for example, or if you put something in the feed uh, to prevent or treat respiratory disease to the entire group at the time of weaning. And in pigs, when, they move, when they're weaned and put into the nursery, you know, those types of things where we know that this disease is gonna occur probably at this time because of historical evidence. Yep and we're gonna to try to get in ahead of it. Those are gonna be the things that are gonna be discussed and the reasoning is, or the, ass the assertion on the part of the advocacy groups is the only reason you have to use those is because of the nature of the facilities. Mm -hmm. And therein is the, the real crux of the discussion and what it always comes down to is it's the nature of the production facilities that require those uses, which... You, you said something to me the other day that, that has stuck with me on this topic and, and and it gets back to there there aren't new classes of compounds coming out and and the thing about whether we get wrapped around the axle with the the activist groups or things of that nature put that all aside as a responsible industry and as a responsible profession it comes down to do we want to have products that work sure in the future the last time we got a new product class that we're using today in food animals is 1978. 
we've had new modifications, chemical alterations and overcoming some resistance, et cetera, since then, and a lot of new really good antibiotics. But the last time we got a new class was 78. Well, thanks for being on the show today. It's a great show. Uh, great to have Dr. Appley spend some time with us, and we're going to have to get him back on and have a further discussion on this topic for sure. Thanks for watching Doc Talk. Remember, always work with your local veterinarian, and if you want to know more about what we do on Doc Talk, you can find us on the web at www.vet.ksu.edu. Thanks for watching the show today. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, and I'll see you down the road. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Doc Talk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals.